watercolour water reflections that's what we're doing in today's video I'm going to show you how I use this stuff in my own paintings to paint really lovely reflections in watercolour Welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour as well as drawing, tuition, even a little bit of motivation, mixed media and business for artists too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the little bell icon, you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. I make at least one free video a week here on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content for Patreon subscribers. So in this video we're going to be tackling complex water reflections. Now they can be really hard to do in watercolour because there's so much to get in and the paint dries so quickly you end up with hard edges that never looks good when it comes to reflections. So I'm going to be showing you how I use this stuff which is gum arabic in my own paintings. I'm going to be explaining why it's such a help when it comes to painting water reflections. So do be aware as well that the painting parts of this tutorial were filmed over a space of several weeks so you may see some changes in light levels, the colour of my nail varnish, the, uh, the sleeves I'm wearing, something like that. You may also see things sort of appear and disappear in the background because although I have a plan for this video tutorial I'm also filming this as a full painting tutorial for Patreon so you may for example see things like the sky in one clip and then it might be gone in the next clip because these clips will not necessarily be filmed in strict chronological order they're just filmed in the order in which you need to see the process so I hope all that makes some sense and there are full painting tutorials for this painting there's four tutorials showing each and every step of this painting on Patreon on tiers two and three in the meantime let's get on with this tutorial and I'm going to show you how I do these water reflections. We're going to start by looking at the photograph I'm using and the drawing. So here's the photograph that I'm working from and I've actually done the underdrawing. This is quite a large painting so you may not necessarily be able to see all of the painting on screen at one time. I will make sure that later on in the video I zoom out a bit so that you can see the whole thing. And we're going to do the water almost in two stages. So I'm right at the beginning at the moment, I'm about to put the sky in and you always want to think about the water in any painting that's got water in at the same time as you think about the sky. Now photographs can be very deceptive. This one is very overexposed. Another thing that can happen, of course, is the photographer can uh, mess around with things in Photoshop or with filters and just change things a little bit. And you can end up with the water in the landscape looking a completely different colour to the sky when in reality it should reflect it. So you want to be using the same colours in the water as you use in the sky and of course the same colours for the reflections as you use for things like these trees and mountains. For our two stages with the water what we'll do is in the early stages of the painting we'll place the underneath wash, the sky colours in. So we have two sky colours going on here, we have a few flashes of bright blue, they've been washed out above here but you can see that they exist and we've got some cloud shadows and we'll be putting an underwash on of those colours and then later on we'll be going on top of that when it's dry with gum arabic to put the reflections in that are a bit closer in and a bit more complex so it's a two-stage process and between each stage we must allow it to dry so i'll bring you back to the painting after the sky's gone in and we'll be using the same colors to drop into the water so before we look at the mountains and using the gum arabic we're going to start dropping the sky colours into the water. It's so important to reflect the main colours that are used in the landscape and the sky into the water. Let me show you the colours that I have selected for painting the sky. So I will later on list all the, uh, the colours that I use and the materials but I want to start out with a bright blue. One of my favourites is Daniel Smith manganese blue hue and um, I'm going to get a little bit of that and swatch it for you so I'll show you what it looks like. So it's a bit like cerulean on steroids, it's a beautiful bright colour. I do find certainly for European landscapes and I don't actually know where this landscape is, it looks uh, somewhat, has the feeling of America to me but I could be wrong about that. But certainly with landscapes in more temperate climates really I mean, anywhere that's not the Arctic really, I find that these turquoise blues can be a little bit cold so what I like to do is pop a touch of pink in so I've got some permanent rose and I'll just mix a little bit of that with the blue so we'll get some blue first of all I just want you to see the difference it makes now you have to be so careful with this because the manganese hue is a fairly weak color it's stronger than cerulean but nevertheless it's certainly not a staining color and I'm going to get a tiny touch of this permanent rose because this is a very strong colour. So we're going to pick up a tiny bit at a time. Of course I'll mix more than this before I start 
and I'll mix less water into it. But I just want to show you how an addition of a little bit of pink can warm this up. There we are. It may have gone a little bit too far into the purple there. You know, we can always add a bit more blue. So I'll be mixing up a big puddle of that, a bit stronger with the paint, a bit less water until I get just the right shade. And I'll be using it to show the bright blue of the sky and also reflecting it in the water. Now we also have some cloud shadows. And rather than going into a completely different colour, what I'm going to do is mix my own grey from these two colours with the addition of yellow. So the three primaries will always make grey if the emphasis is on the blue. This is a weak blue, so we're going to have to use lots of this. So I'll mix some up for you to show you how that works. And again, the blue is the Daniel Smith. The Permanent Rose is by Jackman's Art Materials UK. And I've also got some lemon yellow that is, again, by Daniel Smith. So I'm going to put a tiny bit of the yellow into the blue. Of course, it's going to go green. What else could possibly happen? But then I'm going to get some pink and pop that in as well. And we're just going to play around with it until we get a nice shadow colour. Can you see it's starting to go to more of a purplish grey now? So at this point we analyse, if it's too green, we put more pink in. So look at the colour you've got. So if it was green, for example, you would know that that's made from blue and yellow, therefore you need more pink. If it had gone far too purple, then you know that purple is made from red or pink and blue, and so you need more yellow. So you just play around with it until it balances out to exactly the right colour. To me, that's a little bit greenish. I would like it to be a bit more purplish, so I will put more blue and more pink in. Let's try the pink first actually and see how that does by itself. Not bad at all. So somewhere between these two colours I have the grey I need for the painting. And if you're asking yourself why don't I just grab a grey, I mean I have, you know, I have boxes full of grey paints. Um, it's because I like to work within a limited palette, particularly within landscapes. It gives them an overall feeling of harmony. So a limited palette doesn't have to mean that you only use a few colours, you only have a few colours. It just means that within a painting, you try not to go into too many different colours. And you try and mix secondary colours and neutrals from the colours that you're already using. Everything becomes much more harmonious that way and your painting will have a certain look to it. It depends, of course, which colours you choose. It could be a dramatic look, a soft look, a cool look, a warm look. It all depends on the colours that you've chosen at the beginning. So I've got a large flat brush here and I'm just going to put some water on and then I'm going to start dropping in that sky colour. I want to roughly mimic what I've got above. Now, it in no means has to be perfect. I could wet, you know, the whole area here, but I think it's such a large area, I think I'm safe to take it in a small place. Just going to get my brush then and start working in like this and almost mimicking what we can see there. Don't forget you have a gap, you know, you have the same distance from there to there as to here, or more or less, it's not always exactly the same, but you know, you want to leave space for those mountain reflections later on and we just get an impression of the water reflecting the colours in the sky. So I'll get on now and do the same in other areas here and drop in some more blue. If you're working in a small area like a river, you want to wet the whole area with clean water. So working within those initial colour mixes that I showed you, we're now going to add the cloud shadows into the water. So I've put the sky shadows in and I'm going to do exactly the same now down here in the water. We're not going to have too much of this colour but we're going to have a little bit of it and again I'm going to go in and just stop fairly close to the blue. This is not an approach I would usually take to sort of go around things but because there's so much white in this sky it really doesn't matter. Now we can take this cloud shadow you know straight across this area where there's foliage and things and then if there are gaps in the foliage later on that'll just show through and look super. So we go in like this and start adding in those areas of shadow. This and this part is actually higher up than the part of the sky that we can see so we've got a lot of leeway here to mess around a bit. Again I've gone off the edge of the water there. You never want hard edges in shadows and water. I mean I say that hard edge shadows on objects in bright midday sun yes but not in water. So I'm going to continue now placing that sky cloud shadow into the water. 
Now what you will notice when I'm painting water is that I never ever paint the water before I paint the things above. So I paint the sky, I reflect it in the water, and then we paint all the things like the mountains, anything else there might be, trees, fences, houses, anything at all. You want to paint all of those before you work into the water and it's really important that you either work within a limited palette or at least write down your colors. You must use the same colors in the water as you use above the water because you're not going to get a realistic feeling of water reflection unless you do that. Let me show you now the colors that I've chosen for the rest of the landscape. So always within landscapes and all of my paintings, in fact, I try to stick to some form of limited palette. That doesn't mean a specific number of colors, but it just means that I don't dip in and out of hundreds of colors within one painting. Sticking to a small range of colors within a painting will help it to hang together and everything will seem more cohesive and have more of, shall we say, a mood to it. So here I've got Talon's Rembrandt Permanent Orange. I chose this, of course, because it was the exact color of the boat seats. But because any orange has a large amount of yellow in, I can also use it to mix warm greens. So we can almost treat it as having a second yellow in the palette. So we haven't only got the lemon for making greens, we can use this as well. It's the opposite color of blue as well, so there's the possibility of greys and neutrals too. Because I wanted a really, really dark neutral that would have been hard to mix without a staining blue, what I chose next was this Talon's Rembrandt sepia. It's actually got duct tape on the tube and that's just because at some point, um, probably when I was moving house, it, uh, it obtained a nice hole, just a small hole. And actually the duct tape has worked amazingly well. So there's a tip if you get a hole in your tube of paint. You can see it's a dark, strong, cold brown. But we can add more water to it and make it paler. If you think you would find a colour like this useful and you don't have one, one hack that you can use is to take your burnt umber, that's a warm brown, and put a little bit of ultramarine or cobalt blue in it. It'll be a bit more granular than this, but you'll get that cold, dark brown, and you can push it more and more into grey by adding more and more of the blue. Because the manganese blue is such a light colour, I wanted also a stronger blue, and there was a strong sense of that warm purplish blue in the mountains in the distance, so I chose this which is French Ultramarine, and this is also by Jackman's Art Materials. It's a really beautiful colour. If you do choose an Ultramarine, you want to make sure that you're choosing one from a professional brand. Even if you can't afford for all of the paints in your box to be professional and that you perhaps need some students' colours, that's fine. But Ultramarine is one of the more expensive pigments to obtain, so what you'll find is that in students' brands, the Ultramarines can be very, very poor. So if you've got a student's brand, and you're looking to replace one or two colors so you don't have to upgrade all in one go to artist quality a good place to start is with the ultramarine and the cerulean you'll really notice a difference in those colors between the cheap and the expensive brands the reason this is just in a little pot here is because it's a manufacturer's sample finally i have another jackman's art materials color and this is sap green I didn't actually need to use a ready-made green in this landscape, but I really wanted to try this out and it had that warm golden quality to it that I liked. It's quite a strong colour, but when you water it down, it becomes a lot more transparent and vibrant. It almost has hints of being a green gold without quite as much yellow in. Now, sap green varies quite a lot between brands, so they don't all look the same. Each brand has its unique sap green. And I should just mention that this particular brand of sap green is not available to buy at the time of making this video. So it's mid-May 2021 and I believe this colour will be released sometime during the summer of 2021. So only a month or two away from release, but it's not available on the website to buy it just yet. I was just lucky enough to try it out in advance and it's a really pretty colour. Added to the three that we swatched earlier, that was the Daniel Smith Manganese Blue Hue, the Daniel Smith Lemon Yellow, and the Jackman's Permanent Rose. These are all the colors that I'll be using in my painting. I don't need to go anywhere else if I need something like a gray. I can just mix it from my limited palette. Now, because I'm often asked on this channel what other materials I'm using, I'm just gonna to explain to you briefly which brushes, paper, and gum Arabic solution I'm using for this tutorial. So apart from paints, these are the other materials I'm using. The paper I'm on, which is uh, not this paper here, this is a sample sheet of a practice paper. 
but the paper I'll be using on my painting today is Fabriano Artistico. This is actually my first painting on that paper. I've swapped over from Saunders Waterford. Now Saunders Waterford is a very good paper but it isn't vegan. I was looking for a paper that was vegan because that's what I am and um, I tried several things which weren't very good. I moved on to the Fabriano Artistico. It's pretty much the last paper that um, I could have tried that was of a very high quality so thank goodness it's really good and um, I actually haven't found it any different to paint on from the Saunders Waterford it's just as good and I'm really happy with that paper so that's the paper the Fabriano Artistico I normally just use a £140 because I stretch my paper always the Gum Arabic is by Jackman's Art Materials, um, that's not Jackson's, that's a different company. So Jackman's Art Materials are a small manufacturer working here in the UK and I have an affiliation with them and I sometimes consult with them and um, collaborate to design products with them. So this is their Gum Arabic. If you're wondering what Gum Arabic is, it's basically a natural glue. It comes from the acacia tree. You will have come across it previously in your life, though you may not have realised it. Not only is it one of the binders that's often used to make watercolour paints, it's edible, so it's used in the food industry, it's used for gummed tape, and if you remember postage stamps before they were self-adhesive, it was on the back of those too. Its main qualities when mixed with watercolour are that it dries shiny, it helps to stick the pigment to the paper, and most importantly, in this tutorial, it slows down the drying time. These are the brushes that I have used to create this painting. This is my essentials brush set, so these are on sale from Jackman's Art Materials. Now you may have similar brushes from other manufacturers. These are synthetic brushes, so these are vegan. These are the three brush shapes that I always recommend to beginners. A large round here with a point, a smaller round brush, and a flat brush. I will link to these brushes in the video description, but if you have a different brand, these shapes here, these are going to be your workhorses. These are going to be the ones that you reach for time and time again. Of course, there are rigger brushes, there are filberts, there are fan brushes, there are all sorts of things, but the majority of your watercolour painting should be done with brushes like this. You'll only really need to swap to other brush shapes when you're looking for special effects and really, really specific techniques. Now for the bit you've been waiting for, I'm going to show you how to apply the gum arabic and the other colours. So gum arabic has many properties as well as being a natural glue, but two of the main ones that we're going for here is the fact that it dries shiny, which is an absolute gift for water. It also slows down drying time, that's really really important when you're trying to get those complex reflections in. And although we're doing quite natural things like mountains here, it works equally well for things like houses and man-made structures. So this is the part of the painting where we really start to see those water reflections and the properties of the gum arabic are going to help make everything look really, really lovely. So here is my gum arabic. Right, if I take the lid off this one, you can see it's got a nozzle on, but they don't all, uh, they don't all come in this format, shall we say, or in this form. So what you sometimes get, I think the Winsor & Newton one has, um, or is it the De La Rone, but one of them is just in a glass jar with a big wide neck in. There's nothing wrong with that, but you generally want to decant like this. Now, of course, a nozzle like this can be handy for direct application. There are other things that you would use gum arabic for, but I'm putting it out into this little pot because it's easier to use. If you've got one of those ones with the wide neck, please don't be tempted to put your paintbrush into it because all that happens is you reactivate, you know, little bits of paint pigment that you had no idea were in your perfectly clean brush, you thought it was clean, and they end up getting in the gum arabic and you end up with mucky gum arabic. Unless you are applying direct to the paper, do decant it into a little dish first. People are always asking me on YouTube where I get my ceramic dishes and trays from. They're just usually found in kitchenware shops, so it's a great place for finding sort of palettes that weren't designed to be palettes. I think this one is meant for butter. So I'm going to show you now how to do the water reflections with the gum arabic. You can see I've started a little bit over here because I'm currently filming for Patreon as well, but I'm going to show you how I do it over this side here. Now any paint that's applied with gum arabic will dry shiny. So what I'm going to do is be very careful that I don't take the gum arabic over anything that's above the waterline. So what I'll do is I'll take the gum arabic across all these cloud shapes because they're reflections of the water but I will go round things like this tree and these lily pads here and the boat. What that will mean is that the water dries shiny, the things that are sat on top of the water dry matte, it'll just help it to give 
those three dimensions and make it really, really look like water. So I'm going to start over here. The great thing about using this is you don't get drying lines in the water. In other words, I can stop and start. If I were to sort of, you know, put this... Uh, this patch of green in here, for instance, and then go off and do something, I'd get a really, um, you know, a hard edge. But as long as I take the uh, the gum Arabic on, I'll maintain that soft edge. I'm going to be adding water to this. I don't tend to pre-mix it in here. I'll just add a little bit with my brush as I apply it. It may be as much as 50% water, probably a little bit less. So I'm just going to get a little bit of water on my brush and start painting it on. At this point, if you're getting some value from this video, if you're finding it helpful, can I ask you as always to click that like button, that thumbs up. YouTube rewards channels with audience interaction. So if you like, share, subscribe, or leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people. My channel is growing really, really fast now. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me on YouTube. It has a feeling, um, a feeling of varnish to it. And I want to get this green area here first. So I'm gonna go out a little further than this. This is where you get to the point where you're trying to sort of remember what colours you use. Now I remember that I used the lemon yellow and I believe I used the sap green here. So I want to go in and I want to, uh, I want to mimic those colours in the water. Remember with water reflections they don't continue on. This slope won't continue on here. It'll go back the other way because you're looking at things being opposite. I'm going to stop the, uh, the gum Arabic just as I get near these other objects here because just like applying water to the paper, I can't quite see where it's going. And once you pick up some gum Arabic on your brush, you'll be able to sort of drag it across with the paint. Getting a little bit more yellow out and my sap green. I'm gonna start by just going in with that yellow here. Remember, you've got a lot of leeway for adjustment because water reflections aren't always identical to what's above. The stiller the water, the, uh, the more everything will appear the same. But generally we're just looking at getting something a little bit similar, going a little bit darker here. It's quite a good idea to go quite dark near the water's edge. You can just give it that depth. And what you've got with this gum Arabic is you've got 10 minutes to apply instead of, you know, one and a half minutes before everything dries. Now that's not an exact rule. If you live in a very hot country, it may not be that much time at all but you can just work in smaller sections as i said you won't get drying lines between the sections which is one of the great things about this now you see over here it goes much darker because we went into the ultramarine there so i'm now going to go in with this much darker color like so and i'm going to go up to and around anything that's above the waterline you can see the gum arabic wasn't quite across this area but we'll naturally be dragging some across as it mixes with the paint, so don't worry about that. And I also want to start thinking about getting those darker shapes in for the trees that are on the top there. Again, don't worry about getting these exact. If you can just get an impression that something similar is going on, you have so much more time to manipulate your image with the gum Arabic. I'm going to get on and paint a little bit more of this. I'll bring you back in a minute when I've done some more. So you can see I'm working into these gaps here and going around these little lily pads. I mean, this is the trickiest bit really. You know, some of the larger areas will be much easier. You can see here, I've got this tree here with all of this orange going on. So you want to look at sort of the shape of the tree as it comes around here and imagine that it would sort of come around like this. So that's what we're going to get in next. I'm going to start by putting some more of the gum arabic over this side here. What you want to do is actually take gum arabic over all of the area that's going to be water. For instance, even if I leave some sky showing here, which I may do, I want to put the gum arabic on it because it dries shiny. It doesn't look like the rest of the paint. And so in order to make the water look like it's separate from the landscape and to, um, to give it that shiny effect, we're going to put this gum arabic on every part of the water even if we're not adjusting the colors there because as i said gum arabic can be used for many things but the fact that it's shiny is just a gift for water so we'd be crazy not to take advantage of that i remember that i painted this with the sap green and i dropped some orange in i was sticking to my limited palette and using the orange that i was using for the boat so we can go in like this and then just get some orange straight from my palette and go in there. 
If anything, you want to err on the side of going a little darker in the water and at the waterline, so I'll take some ultramarine in there as well. And just working my way around these lily pads and around any areas that are sitting on top of the water. That way they stay matte and the water stays shiny. Again, it doesn't matter if you don't get these shapes exactly, if you accidentally paint over a little bit. It doesn't matter if the colours are a little bit different. Just as long as you get a vague reflection of what's going on up there in the water, so you can get away with a little bit of, uh, little bit of artistic licence and again, you know, dropping these orange colours into... I'm going to continue now painting with these colours around this area here. Again, I'm looking at this area of, uh, of tree and thinking how does it come round where are those bright oranges I think they're kind of up here and dropping some of those in and you can work these colors directly on the paper it's actually just the same as when I was working on the part that's above the water as below the water we'll go a bit brighter up here with the sap green maybe even a little yellow just let the colors blend on the paper keep these edges a little bit broken going to work in here making sure that I still keep some gum arabic dipping into the gum arabic if I need to and applying a little bit directly to the paper with my brush. So we've got this area down here done again I'm working across with the gum arabic just going to bring it up to any areas where I've previously been and make sure that I'm covering all of the uh, all of the painting going around the boat because that's sitting above the waterline. Now this area here there's not going to be any other um, any other paint going on but I'm still going to take the time later on to uh, water down this gum arabic and take it right across those areas because as I said it's going to add that lovely shiny effect. Now for these little blue mountains I used a combination of a few things. I used the, uh, the Daniel Smith manganese blue hue and also some of the Jackman's ultramarine and little bits of orange too. So again, I'm going to be using the exact same colors and just roughly getting an idea of where things sit. Now, of course there would be more accuracy if I drew, but because gum arabic is a natural glue, I'd be blocking all those pencil lines in. So it would actually be really, really noticeable. And I think it would look less realistic than if I were to get, you know, a few inaccuracies, shall we say, when adding the, uh, the elements in the water. We've got much more softness to the reflection than the hard edges above, but that's absolutely fine. I'm going to bring the gum arabic across now and join up these areas here. So the gum arabic I'm adding now is meeting the gum arabic that I placed on before. I'm going to start working in now. I'm using the sap green and the ultramarine. For the purposes of this little video, the colours I'm using don't matter. It's just to give you an idea of uh, how to use the medium, shall we say. Please excuse any banging noises that you can hear. It's, um, it's a basic fact of, um, of physics, actually, that my neighbour feels the urge to do um, DIY projects the second I start filming anything. I mean, it really, really is uncanny. It's a kind of psychic power he has, actually. He just, um, he's sitting there doing something completely different and then, you know, suddenly the thought of using a hammer or an angle grinder just, uh, just occurs to him and he, he can't stop himself. As I said, it's some kind of physical force. I, I think he's unable to control it. The force of nature. So I'm going to continue working in now with the rest of my mountain reflections. So all I'm doing now is just some finishing touches. I think it's a bit too yellow down here. Any areas that you've previously added the gum arabic to that have now dried, you can, of course, just re-wet them. It will actually reactivate with water as well. So I'm just thinking, you know, this area here, this yellow, is a little bit distracting so I'm just going to blend that in a little bit and just a matter of going in now with any more darks that I want. Now the last thing I'll do to this painting is I'll get some completely clean water and some gum arabic and I'm going to paint gum arabic over all of the rest of the water even to the point of going around these areas here. This bit here looks a little bit white and uncomfortable. I may drop some more cloud shadow in as I go but that's pretty much it for my water reflections. If you want to see this finished painting how it looks at the end you can pop over to my Facebook group. It's got exactly the same name as this YouTube channel. 
So do let me know in the comments if you found this tutorial useful. I'm always up for your suggestions as well of other videos that you would like me to make. Before you go, please do have a look in the video description. There are some free downloadable guides. You can grab there, some downloadable PDFs that you can get for no money whatsoever. I'll also list all the materials that I used in this tutorial. You can also find links to my Facebook group, my Patreon page, and I also have more structured, formal online courses if that is what you need. If you enjoyed this video, but you struggle a bit with your landscape drawing, I have a great video of composition tips that you're gonna find really, really useful for laying out landscapes. You can watch that video right now.